I'm going to tell you how to eat your entropy and have it too. Uh, so we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, let's first go over our goal, make sure we're on the same page. Um, so our goal is to have our cake and eat it too, except instead of cake, we're talking about entropy. So now that we're clear on that, um, uh, let me tell you what an RNG with input is and what the premature next problem is. Uh, so a theoretical PRG is the method that cryptographers, I think, usually think about when they think about getting randomness. Uh, so it works something like this. You have some function that's a PRG. It starts with some state, S0, um, and it outputs some new state, S1, and some randomness, R0. And if you want a bunch of randomness or pseudo-random bits, you just run this a bunch of times, and you get a bunch of pseudo-random bits, and this is wonderful. The only problem is that you have to start out with uniformly random state, and in practice, uniformly random things are hard to find, right? So this isn't quite ideal. It's not quite what developers tend to use. Developers tend to use what we're calling RNGs with input. So they're these sort of black boxes, um, and the purpose is they have some sort of so source of entropy, say like interrupt timings or something like that, and uh, the, in, uh, the interrupt timings might, or the, the source of entropy might provide some input. Um, this input uh, will, might have some entropy, we don't know, but if it does, we hope to accumulate the entropy inside the state of the RNG with input. Um, and this can keep happening, we can continue accumulating more entropy as we receive more input, um, and eventually we hope to reach some threshold where we have sufficient entropy, um, at which point we hope that the RNG with input will be secure, by which we mean that um, it can provide output that's pseudo-random. Um, so this is the basic object that we're studying. Uh, it very much exists in practice. This is Linux's uh, RNG with input. It's very complicated and ad hoc, um, but it's very poorly studied in theory. Um, this first study started uh, not until 2005 by Barak and Halevi, um, and they provided a model which was great, but it only recovered from compromise. It only, it only guaranteed security after receiving one full entropy input. So this is an ideal because, again, full entry pay inputs are hard to find. Um, so the basis for our work will be uh, Dodis et al. who, who uh, solved this problem. Um, so uh, our main concern is this problem called the premature next attack. So in the premature next attack, we again have our RNG with input. Um, and after we receive our input, we imagine some adversary coming along. And this adversary can see the output of our PRG. Um, uh, uh, and what will happen here, well, our RNG is not secure yet. We can't guarantee that um, uh, this, these bits will be pseudo-random, so potentially the adversary will learn something about our state. Um, in the worst case, he'll learn everything about our state, in which case all of our entropy is lost. Uh, and this is quite a devastating attack because it can be repeated, right? So um, we can receive more input. Um, uh, the adversary can request more knowledge, uh, get more knowledge of our state, and we'll lose our entropy again. And this can keep happening over and over and over again. And in practice, this is really a legitimate practical attack um, because uh, we can make many, many requests on our RNG. These bits can fly all over the web or, or an adversary can have access to them in another way. Um, so this is really quite devastating. It's something that we want to really consider. Uh, so the question is, what can we do if the adversary looks early? Um, our first, the first uh, answer you might come up with is just don't let him. Um, so. In this case, the adversary simply promises that he won't look until we're ready. Uh, this is our new adversary. Um, uh, then we'll receive a bunch of inputs. Um, we'll accumulate some entropy. And after we've sort of gotten enough, the adversary will peek out from behind his tree. And uh, uh, then we'll uh, have accumulated enough entropy, so we'll be secure. We'll have pseudo-random bits. Um, so that's wonderful, uh, and this is roughly, well, it's a caricature of the solution of DOTUS at all. They didn't solve this problem, uh, 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 so this is roughly the model that they used. Um, an alternative option that's used in practice a lot is estimating entropy, right? So uh, in this model, we can take some input, uh, we can estimate its entropy in some way, and then when the adversary makes a request, we can say, well, we know we don't have enough entropy yet, we're not secure, so we're just not going to give you anything. So in other words, the RNG will not release any output until it feels that it's secure. Um, so this is wonderful. Uh, the adversary will obviously learn nothing from this. We can continue getting inputs um, and eventually output pseudo-random bits, and everyone's happy, except there's one problem with this. We can't estimate entropy. Um, it's provably impossible, and even in some weak models, it's computationally difficult. Um, so this doesn't quite work. So uh, I'm a theoretician. Option three is to prove impossibility. Th this, I think, would make a very nice paper. Uh, probably get into crypto, but unfortunately it's possible, so we have to do something else. Um, uh, 
Uh, so this brings us to option four, which is to pool your entropy. Um, again, an idea that's very much used in practice. So what do I mean by this? Well, we have our source of entropy, um, we receive some input, uh, and we simply decide that this is going to go into one pool of the state. So our state is now divided into many pools, and we'll simply choose um, in some clever way that I'll describe later uh, where our input is going to go. Um, so we get some more input, it goes into a different pool, more input goes into a different pool, et cetera. And now if our adversary comes along and requests some output from the PRG, we're only going to give him output uh, from one specific pool, which again will be chosen cleverly in a way that I'll describe later. And what's nice about this, the adversary can get this entropy essentially, he can learn about the state of this one pool, but he won't learn about the state of these other pools. So this is the thing to note, that's the green stuff still there. Um, so this can go on uh, for a while longer, the adversary can make some more requests, uh, we can continue to accumulate entropy, and hopefully at some point one of the pools will fill up, and now we consider R&D to be secure. So if at some point later the adversary makes a request and we happen to give him uh, something from this pool, well, it will be pseudo-random, so we sort of win. Um, so that's the rough model. Um, this is an idea that's very much used in practice. I think it was originated by Kelsey, Schnarr, and Ferguson in 1999 with their Yarrow construction. Um, this only had two pools. Uh, the idea was expanded quite a lot by Ferguson and Schnarr in their Fortuna construction, which had many pools with a very, sorry, many pools with a very clever scheduling scheme. Uh, and it's the basis for our work. Um, and indeed, just to show you that this is very much used in practice, this is, these are the operating systems that use Yarrow, um, and Windows 8 uses a modified version of Fortuna. Um, so here's our formal construction, which is essentially a generalization of the Fortuna model. Um, we take an RNG with input that is not secure against premature next, we combine it with an object called a scheduler, um, and we get an RNG with input that is secure against premature next. Um, so a scheduler is something that decides when pools should be filled and empty, as I showed you earlier. I'll describe this in much more depth in a second. Um, an RNG with input uh, that's not secure against premature next, we can just use a, a Dotus et al.'s construction. Um, so here's a little bit more about our construction. Indeed, all of our pools will be RNGs with input themselves uh, in the Dotus et al. model. Um, and the scheduler will determine uh, when we receive an input where it should go. So maybe our first input will go to this pool, we receive a new input, the scheduler decides it goes to this pool, et cetera. This can keep happening for a while, and at some point the scheduler will decide, okay, now we want some output. Um, so when we want some output, what happens? Well, there's one pool I haven't told you about called the register. Uh, it's a special pool, and every time an output request gets made um, by the scheduler, uh, the entropy sort of moves from, the, um, uh, uh, from this pool to the register. Um, then when the adversary comes along, he's only given access to the register. So all output from the RNG comes from the register. Um, so if the register's not full, again, we imagine the adversary sort of eating this entropy. Um, but what's nice is we still have entropy in all these other pools. Um, so if things keep going on for a while, uh, the story is quite similar. Eventually one of the pools might fill up. Um, and if we later make an output request to that specific pool, the entropy will essentially transfer to the register, um, and then uh, from then on we'll be secure, we'll have pseudo-random bits. Uh, so that's the rough idea, uh, slightly more detailed, this is a bit hand wavy. Um, our pools are RNGs with input a la Dotus et al. Um, the register is more like the Barack Levy construction, um, and the proof of security, though this might look simple, is actually highly non-trivial. Um, so I think I've motivated the idea of a scheduler. Uh, now, for the rest of the talk, I will describe schedulers. Um, so what is a scheduler? Well, it's something that defines an input sequence, an output sequence. Um, the inputs are pools to fill, and the outputs are pools to empty. Um, uh, we model it formally just as a function, so it's stateful. It takes a state and a key, and it outputs a new state, and uh, an input pool, and an output pool. And of course, we can just run this many times, and that will give us uh, our uh, sequence of inputs and outputs. Um, so this is a cryptographic primitive. It has a security notion with an adversary. Um, our adversary is going to output a bunch of weights, W1 through WQ. Uh, we think of these weights as the entropy of each input, although we'll normalize them so that one is maximal just for convenience. Um, and after the adversary gives some weights, uh, he'll be given a key. I encourage you to look at the paper for the details of this. Um, and he'll output a start state. So the adversary is going to decide sort of when our computer boots up, essentially, or when our RNG was compromised. Um, and we'll also consider one important special case, which is when this uh, sequence is all constant. So W1 equals W2 equals WQ. Um, 
Uh, so given this, we can define a security game. The scheduler takes in the start state and its key. It outputs this sequence. Um, we take the adversary's uh, uh, sequence of weights and we simply drop them in the pools in the sequence as defined by the scheduler. So input one will go uh, in pool in one, uh, input two will go, oh, and um, if we then output from the same pool, uh, we simply empty it, uh, input two will go in pool two, um, et cetera. Things will keep happening. Um, and again, if eventually one of our pools fills up and uh, we happen to output from this pool, then we win. So this is a scheduler security game. I hope the analogy between this and an RNG with input uh, is clear. Um, so with this, I can show you the original Fortuna scheduler, which only works in the constant rate case. So this is the case when all weights are the same. Uh, so it starts out with roughly log Q pools. Remember, Q was the length of the sequence. Um, uh, so we can number these pools 0 through P minus 1. Um, and the pools are filled in a round robin order. So what do I mean by this? Well, first we fill pool zero, then we fill pool one, then we fill pool two, et cetera, um, all the way up to pool P minus one. Uh, and every P steps, we're going to empty one pool. Uh, so for example, um, after the first round, we will empty pool zero. Um, more generally, the kth pool to be emptied will be the largest i, such that two to the i divides k. Now, if that's a bit opaque, this simply means that uh, the first pool will be emptied every two rounds, the next pool every four, then every eight, uh, et cetera, powers of two all the way up to two to the p. Um, and you might notice that two to the p is roughly q. This is not an accident. Um, so why does this make sense? Uh, well, the very rough idea, imagine that our weight is something like one over two to the i, then the first i minus one pools will be useless. They'll all be emptied too often to fill up. Um, but uh, the ith pool uh, will fill in roughly p over w steps. Now, if you think about it, since we're receiving rate w and we want um, a total of one weight, um, uh, if we knew w, then we would recover in one over w steps. So we're losing roughly a factor of p, uh, which we call our competitive ratio. Um, so this is wonderful. Unfortunately, Fortuna is not secure uh, when the rate is not constant. It wasn't designed to be so. Um, this is relatively easy to see. There's a simple attack. Imagine the adversary just essentially drops all of the weight in one pool. So for example, the adversary can give us an input with a lot of entropy uh, at first, and then give us a bunch of inputs with no entropy. Um, Fortuna will then do its job and empty this pool. Then the adversary can move on, put some more entropy in this pool. This process repeats. We never recover. Um, so this is sort of just the premature next attack modified. So this leads to two natural questions, I think. One is, is the entropy loss of log Q inherent? Um, the answer is unfortunately yes. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. The next is, can we handle non-constant rate? And the answer is happily yes. Um, I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, so first I'll show you the lower bound. Uh, uh, so we're going to slightly switch metaphors here. We're now going to imagine at each time step, uh, we're going to think about the input that comes at that time step. We're gonna ask when does it leave? So the input uh, that comes first might, for example, leave at step three. The input that comes at second might leave at step five. Uh, the input that comes at step three might leave at step four. And now that we're at step three, well, input one's meant to leave, right? So this is when it's sort of given to the adversary. So this is roughly my model. It's roughly equivalent. Uh, we can watch it go for a bit longer. Um, and in particular, after step five, you see I have uh, uh, um, blocks two and four here to leave at the same time. So you'll notice that they leave together. Um, and uh, our winning condition is uh, when one over W blocks leave at the same time. So hopefully it's clear how this is uh, just a reformulation of the same model. Um, and if you think about it, we achieve a competitive ratio of P if, we, uh, if for any W, uh, uh, we win in P over W steps for any starting point. Uh, now a slightly different way to say this is for each interval I of length P over W, there must be a group of one over W blocks um, that enter an interval i and leave together an interval i, right? So the blocks have to leave together so that uh, the adversary receives all this sort of entropy at the same time, um, and they have to leave uh, within p over w steps because uh, this is our winning, uh, this is required, this is what we need to get a competitive ratio of p. Um, so with this in mind, let's prove our theorem. Uh, so here's what we do. We think about our blocks as they come in sequence. Um, let's imagine, uh, for example, that P equals two, and let's consider the case W equals one. 
then uh, our statement says that we should look at intervals of length two. Um, so we look at these intervals, uh, and it tells us that there must be a group of one block that enters in each interval and leaves in the same interval. So let's simply mark all of those blocks. Let's say they're these. Um, we then can consider the case when w equals a half because we need to achieve this competitive ratio for all weights. Um, in the case where w equals a half, um, our, our statement tells us that we should look at uh, intervals of length four. Um, and in these intervals, there must be a group of two blocks that enter in the interval and leave together in the interval. Now, remember that all of the blocks that I've shown you so, so far, all of the blocks that I've marked so far, leave at distinct times, right? They all leave in disjoint intervals. So as a result, we must mark at least one new block in each of these intervals. Uh, so we can mark one more block, uh, and if we can continue in this fashion for a while, after we, if there are Q total blocks, after we've considered all possible weights, weights one through weights one over Q, um, then we'll have marked this many blocks total. Uh, uh, in the first part, we mark Q over P, then Q over 2P, et cetera. Um, and in total, we get, uh, this is just a harmonic series, so we can sum this up, and we get uh, Q log Q uh, over P blocks. Um, but of course, we can't mark more than Q blocks because there are Q blocks total. Um, so if we simply notice that, we get our lower bound uh, that P must be greater than roughly log Q. Um, so this is the lower bound. Uh, now let me show you our general scheduler, which works in uh, the general case regardless of uh, the weight sequence. So recall Fortuna, it had log Q pools. The pools were filled in round robin order. Um, one pool was emptied every P steps, and uh, they were emptied in these sort of powers of two sequence. Um, we'll make only one modification. We're going to replace round robin with pseudo random. So what do I mean by that? Well, we're going to take some PRF with some key, uh, and we're going to evaluate it at one to decide where the first pool will be empty, uh, which pool to be emptied first, uh, evaluate it at two for the second pool, evaluate it at three for the third pool, et cetera. Um, uh, so I won't give you the full proof here. It, it's slightly involved. In particular, note that the key is public, so there, there are some subtleties here. Um, but uh, what we achieve is a log Q times log one over epsilon competitive ratio, where, one, where epsilon is uh, the, the probability of failure. Um, and the intuition behind this is just that by churn off, we ex expect the pools to be filled roughly evenly after sufficiently many steps, and then the proof goes through roughly, roughly like the proof of Fortuna. Um, uh, so that's the construction. Let me give you some concrete numbers. Um, to generate a secure 128-bit key, uh, in the constant rate case, we need three kilobytes of entropy, not too bad. In the arbitrary case, we need 20 kilobytes of entropy, which I admit is a re relatively high price to pay, but we're also solving a hard problem. Uh, and in particular, you need not choose between two constructions. These are all, uh, these are both achieved by the same construction, so you can just build this. If you happen to live in a relatively benevolent world, you'll get a recovery after three kilobytes. Uh, if you happen to live in a very adversarial world, as many of us do, you'll not recover until 20 kilobytes. Um, so that's essentially my talk. Let me just give you a summary of our work. Uh, we achieve a very strong security notion inspired by Fortuna and the standard model. Um, we provide formal analysis of Fortuna and improve it a little bit. In fact, we roughly double the entropy rate. Um, and uh, I think this talk is a nice uh, merging between theory and practice. In particular, it's a theoretically interesting problem, theoretical solution. Um, very practical results, something used in practice, uh, and it was even received well during peer review. <laughs> so that's my talk. Thanks a lot. <laughs>